Hi everyone, um, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar on intro to laser diffraction. Um, this is always a very popular topic for those who are either looking into a course refresher or being inaugurated into the particle world. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen and with me is your speaker today, Dr. Jeff Bodycomb. Hi Jeff. Hi, how are you? <laughs> very good. How's okay. everybody in particle world? <laughs> yes. Particle is everywhere. I figure that's a very generic term to describe what we are going to talk about today. I'm going to go ahead and close and pass the ball to Jeff. Jeff, take it away. Okay, well, thanks. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And as Julie mentioned, I'm going to be uh, talk, introducing the laser diffraction uh, as a particle characterization technique. Uh, I'm Jeff Bidecombe. I'm with Hariba Scientific in the particle characterization group, along with Julie. Uh, so, uh, kind of like to give a little bit of perspective of where we are operating here. Let's get this out of the way. Um, I make a plot on the left resolution of mixture components and across the bottom particle diameter in microns, going from really sub-micron up to tens of millimeters. Uh, laser diffraction kind of falls in the middle and in a very commercially important range of tens of nanometers up to millimeters. And you'll find that used in everything from batteries to CMP slurries to food. Uh, Julie mentioned uh, your ibuprofen, quite often laser diffraction would be used to characterize the powders uh, that are then compressed to make the tablet. Uh, the instruments implemented at Haribo would be, would be in the LA960 and LA350. As you move towards larger particle sizes, you would be looking at image analysis in the upper right of the graph. Uh, and if you start looking at questions like concentration, you might lean much more towards the view size of 3000 and nanoparticle tracking analysis. If you need to go smaller, you're looking at dynamic light scattering and the SC100. So um, kind of a quick and easy comment I like to make, why are we looking at particle size? Uh, so particle size drives the performance of and manufacturability in, in a lot of industries. So ceramic powders, uh, particle size will affect uh, density and, and compaction. Uh, construction materials, very much the same. Uh, chemical, you see particles come up in everything from uh, how, how well the material will flow to how quickly it reacts. Pharmaceutical, from how well something compacts into a tablet to how uh, how quickly it dissolves in your stomach for, for oral dosage. Uh, batteries use particles as well. Uh, they're only particle slurries. They're made up into cathodes, anodes, and so on, and so on down the line. We have a number of webinars covering many of these areas uh, on our website. So. Uh, uh, with that, let's leap into laser diffraction and really what's going on. So the core idea of laser diffraction is we use light and we look at look at the particles as a function of uh, uh, look at the scattering from the particles as a function of angle and convert that into a size distribution. So what's going on is when light slides, strikes a particle. I have a blue particle and I move from left to right. Some of the light is reflected off of the particle surface. Some is refracted as bent as it goes through the particle and comes out. Some is absorbed and re-rated and some interacts with the particle surface in not quite a reflection type phenomena, but uh, diffraction. So quick couple things from this picture. One is that if you look at this, you say, well, we have to know what's happening inside the particle. Uh, for refracted and uh, for refracted light. And so you need to know the optical properties of particles. This is particularly important for smaller particles um, where light's uh, so small enough that more than the edges matter and large enough that light still has to do something inside the particle. Uh, one thing we'll have to do, and this is good, is light collect light over a wide range of angles. Mercifully, uh, you can simply buy an instrument that does all this for you. 
So this is a schematic of the LA960, uh, a Hariba laser diffraction analyzer, optics, uh, and all the commercial instruments uh, have a similar optical arrangement. Not all of them have both, both detectors, but roughly you're going to have a light source. So coming in from the, from the right, I have a semiconductor laser, a lens, some sort of way of getting my sample in the middle. And then I will have detectors at a range of angles. And I tend to have a forward detector as a single plate uh, that lets me get to very small angles. And I could comment on why uh, a few slides. That's what's happening inside of the instrument. Well, all this action is happening uh, and because we're looking at some, something known as a diffraction pattern. And some of you have seen this, if you shine light on something um, and that material is small or you have a screen that's far enough away to look at very small angles, you'll see bright and dark spots coming off, the, off of that, uh, in this case, the, this block. And, and that will tell you about the size and shape of that particular item. Now, why does this happen? It happens because light is a, uh, is a wave. You have an oscillating electric field and an oscillating magnetic field. And bottom right of this graph, you see a nifty graphic about how the fields oscillate and progress through space over time. So really want to focus on just electric field and conceptually just let the magnetic field follow along. So because I have waves, I have interference phenomena. So I have the red wave and the blue, blue wave. And if I have them lined up so the peaks of both match and I add them together, I get a, much, a wave with a much larger amplitude. So if I have the red and the blue, uh, th those are two beams of light. And if they interfere just right, it becomes brighter. However, if I have two beams that are offset, like the green and red below, you can see the peak of the red matches the valley of the green, peak of green matches valley of red. I start adding them up point by point, and I get a very, very weak wave. And so if I had these two beams of light, I line them upright, I don't get any light out the other end. Now, this is important because if I zoom in on a particle and I have scattering off two points of a particle, which is shown here, and I look at a certain angle, I'm going to have one wave that travels some distance to my detector. I have a second wave that travels a slightly different distance to the detector. And so these two waves, you start at, at the detector, you add them up, and if they, if the distance is just right, they'll add up and make something brighter. And if it's just wrong, they will add up and leave no light at all. So you have bright and dim spots on your detector. So now I, ha I mentioned we have a bunch of detectors at different angles, and then some detectors will see a lot of light, some will not, will not see very much. And so you need to invert this data to find a particle shape. And we use optical models to interpret the data and understand our experiments. And so far, as you've probably guessed, I'm telling you what's happening inside of your instrument. I want to reassure you that if, uh, if you think it's the magic box where you press the button, the answer comes out. In practice, you're right. And this is just giving you a little insight about what we're doing. And if you don't catch it all, you can come back and look later or, or simply not worry about it. And that's going to go for the next slides with lots of math. So two models, and I do want you to remember the two models, Fraunhofer and me. Fraunhofer is more straightforward math, uh, or only in comparison to me. It works for large opaque particles, but it really treats them as two-dimensional disks. And I use this to develop intuition these days. The fast computers make me shy away from it otherwise. And for all particle sizes, there's a much more exact treatment called me. Uh, and they're both named after mathematicians who developed it. Very messy calculations, but it does treat the uh, particles as three-dimensional objects and worries about what happens to light inside of the particle. And this is particularly important as your particle size starts 
going down. So there's a Fraunhofer approximation. Uh, so the simple approximation only uses Bessel functions of the first, con first kind. I'll tell you what you're going to get with me scattering. If the particle size is more than about 50 microns, you get good results with Fraunhofer. So that's kind of take home there. Uh, we used to say 20. I looked at the new at the most recent ISO and bumped that number up to 50. I'll comment a little bit more. But what about our in intuition? And this is where I think the math is a little more helpful. Uh, if you have, if you plot scatter intensity on the left as a function of scattering angle, and I have a linear plot on the left and log, semi log, oh, sorry, log log plot on the right, uh, you see that the first peak at 100 microns happens at a smaller angle than the first peak for a 50 micron particle. So that's maybe half a degree and at 50 microns at 1.2 degrees. The second is that as the particle size goes up, so that's easiest to see in the log log plot, you get a higher scattered intensity um, for these larger particles. What this comes down to in practice is you'll notice your analyzer is often quite heavy. And that's because we need a very stiff uh, instrument in order to ensure we keep those very, very small angles for proper measurement of small particles. And so kind of the real punchline of this graph is your instrument weighs more than you wish it did. I've mentioned kind of size ranges and the 50 micron. So we're gonna have a little poll just for fun where we will see, do you work with particles with sizes? Uh, let's get the poll up. So let's start voting. Yeah, so this is one of those vote vote as many places you want. Are your sizes over one millimeter, between 50 microns and one millimeter? Between two and 50 microns or less than two microns? Kind of gives us a sense of size ranges you like to operate. I probably should have thrown in another one at below 100 nanometers, but that's okay. Uh, and, and as you filling it out, I see most people work uh, all right, most people work at less than two microns, and as hefty fraction you work also go up to 50, and a few you go up past 50 microns. So let's, I'll give you just a few more seconds to vote. Let's close that. And I think I'm showing the results. So only about 19% of you ever encounter a sample where you're gonna think about use where your Fraunhofer is applicable. Uh, so and, and and so that's valuable to keep in mind as you start thinking about these things. Uh, modern analyzers all offer the uh, me option, so that's not too much of a worry. So these are the uh, me scattering equations. I'm not going to comment further, except I circled the three parameters we kind of keep track of, uh, which is m, x, and theta. So the whole mess of math, but it says that my scattering is a function of, the, of this value m, this value x, and this value theta. So x is your uh, scaled particle size. And so that's diameter divided by wavelength. And so that tells me that if I want to go to smaller particle sizes, it's very helpful to go to shorter wavelengths of light. So that's, uh, and I'll show a graph about that shortly, but that's really why we have a blue light source in the analyzer so we can go to smaller particle sizes reliably. Um, the next is this M and that's a refractive index ratio. That's really the complex refractive index of the particle divided by complex refractive index of the material. Uh, as this value goes to one, you get no scattering because the uh, it's the same refractive index values for both. And finally, theta is your scattering angle. So this value M really tells you what light is doing inside of the particle compared to what it's doing inside the liquid or the air as you measure. So what is refractive index? It tells you really two things because I'm asking for the complex refractive index, which is a hint about 
uh, this, this math, the complex numbers, real and imaginary, are probably the easiest way to start thinking about these things. Uh, you have a wave of light, say in the air, which has a refractive index of one, and it enters a particle, and the wavelength gets shorter uh, because of the other material in the particle. So I pick two, just to make the graph look nice. And then, so the wavelength shifts and the amplitude goes down as you travel through the particle. And that really is absorption in the particle. And that's the imaginary term. Um, and finally, the light comes out the other end. In this case, a lot has, has been absorbed. And so you have a much dimmer uh, wave coming out the other end. We need to know this refractive index value to get at what's happening inside the particle. I will comment, uh, and I did this a while back, that a poor choice of refractive index generally is much smarter than a, uh, a, a two-dimensional model where you just ignore the question completely. I, I threw in a quote from ISO 13320, the 2020 flavor. Uh, for traceable results, it's essential that you report the refractive index values used for your calculation. Uh, that's kind of one of the first things we want to find out as we're looking at data or comparing data or trying to figure out what's going on in a measurement. Effective size with the me calculations follow pretty much the same uh, trajectory as you saw with Fraunhofer, large diameters, small particles. So my 100 micron, that peak is a much smaller angle than say at 10 microns. And then at one micron, you see that peak even moving further and further out until you get no peak for smaller particles or no peak before 180 degrees. I mentioned blue light and small particles. And here's a plot of scatter intensity. Um, and gosh, I forgot to write down the size of the particle. This must be a couple hundred nanometers. The scatter intensity on the left, linear scale, as a function of scattering angle. So there's no peak left. And that's fine. Uh, if I use red, then, and I've normalized the scattered intensity, sorry, uh, between the two, be, two, two wavelengths. If I use red light, my decrease intensity with angle is only 11%. But if I use blue light, my decrease in intensity with angle is 25%. And so that really, well, look, when I'm trying to make a scattering measurement, or making any measurement, I want to see something change. And so a change of 25% is much easier to, to, to observe and treat accurately than a change of 10%. Uh, so if you want to measure small particles accurately, you like the short, weight, short light because you have a, a more distinct signal. Uh, you also are, have less demands on your background. So you're really your background scattering uh, measurement should be within, say, 1% to get to these small particles. So if you have dirty or varying liquid in which you're measuring your particles, you're going to find yourself in a bit of trouble. So that explains why you have the blue light in the LA960. And then the angular dependence tells you why you have such a heavy instrument. So here's a nice example result of some 30 nanometer, 40 nanometer, 50, and 70 nanometer polystyrene latex standards. Uh, so we have data from very small particles by laser diffraction. And depending kind of in some other issues in your measurement, this is really the range where you can consider either dynamic light scattering or laser diffraction. We have a nanoparticle tracking analysis. What happens if you're mixing particles? So I make a measurement and no, very, very few real samples have all particles the same size. Well, you can just add up the scattering from each of the particle sizes, weight by the number of particles or mass of particles uh, at each size, and you'll have some sort of weighted sum, which is shown one micron in green, two micron in black. I mix them together. You get a sort of scattering pattern that you see below where I see some peaks go away and some peaks get more pronounced. Again, this is intensity versus angle, semi-log scale. Before I get into untangling the mess, um, comment on me scattering versus Fraunhofer. And uh, let me comment, the reason Fraunhofer uh, kind of got a foothold 
if you will, in scattering, is laser diffraction uh, is just a phenomenally useful technique uh, because it's fast, it applies to a lot of samples, and so it's been used really since before we had uh, fast computers. So, uh, and, and, and earlier computers just could not handle the calculation load of me scattering. Uh, so I, I plot up some comparisons, uh, Fraunhofer and the dashed red, the blue is me. And for 10 microns, smaller particles, that match between the two is quite poor. Uh, for larger particles, say this 100 micron, then you see that all the peaks in the for red and blue match out for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth order peak before you start seeing any deviations. Uh, these days, fast computers, there's no practical reason uh, to, to, uh, to stay away from me. Yeah, so this is ISO 13320, their comment. For most particles larger than about 50 microns with a relative refractive index, that's an M value I mentioned before, uh, then 1.2. So that's refractive index of the particle divided by refractive index of your liquid. So if you're in water, uh, relative, and you're refractive index 1.33 and you have a particle with a refractive index of uh, 2.6 can't think of anything like that offhand then your relative refractive index value is two uh, it says such knowledge may not be necessary that's refractive index as me and Fraunhofer both give similar results so there's a comment about when you might consider uh, two different approaches but I like my statement stick the computer does all the work and they're fast enough, so just go with that. What happens in practice? Well, um, here's some glass beads and this is a glass bead standard and I have a nice peak right where I expect it at about 15 microns. If I ran it in the Fraunhofer kernel, then I get two peaks. And that's because uh, I really need to account for some of the reflection off of the uh, glass bead surface, as well as the amount of light that actually just gets all the way through the glass because they basically act like mini lenses. And the me calculations are much, uh, much, uh, well, they, they capture all that accurately rather than pretending that my my glass sphere is an opaque uh, two-dimensional two disc. CMP slurry, again, another, these are much smaller particles, fairly high refractive index. And you know, if you don't have the right model, you get a very wrong answer. So you expect, in this case, this is uh, actually some older data now, about 150 nanometer slurry. So I have a nice peak at 0.15. If I use the wrong calculation, I get a peak at two, three, four microns. So the computer does all the calculations. I, I do want to comment a bit about convergence. Uh, other manufacturers call it different things. You, ha you need a way to treat your borderline data. And, and one way of looking at that is that uh, if, you, if you have a, a initial calc um, intensity, you calculate distribution, you back calculate to see if the distribution, the intensity from that distribution calculated matches. If they differ by too much, you go back and try again. If you keep doing that over and over again, you'll eventually overfit your data um, and you'll get, find yourself with a very, very sharp particle size distribution with all these silly noise peaks all over the place. Um, I, so somehow you have to have a way of treating borderline data. Somebody in the math and the calculations has to do it. It's either you as the user or your instrument manufacturer in the software uh, does it for you. And so on the, on the Hariba software, which I kind of know, uh, you can actually pick whether the software picks in the value for you or if you do it yourself. Again, looking at 13320, um, they go into this calculation in, in, in the appendix. This is eight, appendix nine. Uh, it, it's what's known as an ill-posed and ill-conditioned problem. Uh, so small measurements, small errors can make distract direct inversion without constraint unviable. And so that constraint would be your convergence factors, for example. Okay, moving on and, and going back to kind of our comments in the beginning about shape. Uh, particle size, shape, 
and, and, and optical properties affect the angle intensity of scattered light, but you really can't extract shape information without significant a priori knowledge uh, or a, 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 a scattering arrangement that's really not commercially available. So we all go through life pretending everything is spherical. And so we're all just kind of having the ball. So here is the second interactive part of the webinar, which is a pop quiz. What particle shape is used for laser diffraction? Hard sphere, cube, pyramid, easy sphere. I'm not gonna give you a very long to vote. Uh, and actually everybody's getting it right anyway. So. Let's go ahead and close that. Everybody got the right answer. Hard sphere and easy sphere, I give equal credit. Uh, there isn't really any comment in the equations about the, the modules of the spheres. And 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 there isn't, well, I, I avoid the word soft because I didn't want to go into the question of optically soft materials. So let's hide the poll. I think you can see my screen again. You have the answers. Let's get to measurement. So you got this magic box. I kind of told you what's happening inside the magic box. I've told you what's happening inside the magic computer box. And well, we have to do something to get an answer out. The most exciting part of laser diffraction these days is sample preparation. And I don't mean exciting in a good way. Um, so you really have to make sure you get a representative sample out of, out of your drum or whatever. You then want to prepare a suspension if you're measuring as a liquid or in, where your particles are reasonably well separated so they don't flocculate, uh, or if you're using uh, air dispersion, you wanna make sure you use the right pressure to ensure that they don't stick together. And you're measuring uh, the, the individual particles. If the particles are stuck together, we treat them as one particle. I can't tell whether a particle is together for just a tent uh, 30 seconds of measurement or if it's together for life. So you have to prepare the sample so that it looks like it's the way it will be for life. Prepare the sy system, align the laser uh, and acquire a blank. And that's really a button press. It's more difficult to talk about than execute in practice. Then you'll add sample, uh, pump the sample. You might use some ultrasound. Then you click the measure button collect the scattering pattern, and out comes your answer. And you'll often measure multiple times to see if you get the same answer multiple times to check for sample stability. There are all sorts of ways to get samples in. Uh, so volumes really go down now to about 5 ml uh, for what are called dilute suspensions. You can do a concentrated suspension with a much smaller volume in our paste and, and HL cells and then up to 200 ml for a very broad size distributions, as well as dry powder feeders. When you're specking out an analyzer or when you're planning a measurement, you wanna think about these options for how you handle your samples because you, you really wanna pick the option that will give you the lowest measurement cost. And, and costs can include everything from cost of sample to cost of, re, of, of reagents. For example, if you're diluting your sample in an organic liquid, disposal costs might start to be noticeable. Uh, and then the time and effort to clean up the system. Okay, how much material do you need? And, and the answer is it depends. If you have a large, broad distribution, you're gonna need more material. If you have a more narrow or smaller particle sizes, uh, you can use the low volume samples in order to uh, conserve material or or solve or liquid for that matter. So the dispersing volumes go up to about 300 ml and down to about five. I know the slide says 10, but we, we can get to five. Uh, and here are some examples across the bottom. At 100 microns, I need about one milligram of a biopolymer uh, for, yeah, this is a 10 micron max stair rate on the far right and I need 0.165, I wanna make sure I get the units right, uh, 0.165 milligram. For 35 nanometer uh, particles, I need about 130, to 130 milligrams of material. Okay. Now I have a video, I'll show you the 
the measurement process. So basically, it's nowadays all automated. You press feed to load the liquid, you set your uh, circulation and your agitation, or you just load a con condition file. You press a line, now your mirrors and your detectors are lined up. You press blank to collect the scattering signal uh, for subtraction later. And, and, and all that's faster than I can talk about. Then you add sample. So in this case, we're adding drop. Well, we were adding drops of latex to sample bath. When the transmittance levels stabilize or in the right spot, then you stop, you click measure, and we'll start measuring. Measure for a few seconds, and then out comes the measurement results on a separate screen. And of course, you have a system, you need to clean it. You in this case, you click rinse and order to rinse out the, the bath with clean water. One thing to keep in mind with, with all these systems is as soon as you're done, you want to get the particles out of the system. Letting them dry inside is a uh, good way to sign yourself up for more arduous cleaning later on. So for dry powders, uh, and I repeat that liquid graphs at the bottom, but we've gotten down to about five milligrams of material for a number of different particle sizes for dry powder measurement. And this came about uh, basically as, as kind of a game in the lab to see who could measure the smallest amount of material and who had the best methods. Uh, in practice, most people use more than that little tiny speck of material for dry measurement. It's so quick, you just go with a little extra material. And that gives me a chance to show you the practice of a dry measurement. So now we don't have any liquids to wor worry about. Screen set up, we, we hit align, and we click hit blank to subtract the background. And then we can me begin measuring. So you just add your sample to the chute, close the lid, click measure and you'll watch the particles march down the chute, commit suicide into the measurement zone. So they'll just march, they march down the chute, going down, getting measured. And then I have results on the final screen. So if you have a powder that is already dry, a dry powder measurement can be a whole lot faster. Uh, or less or more convenient. Uh, the, but if your material is sticky or if you need more dispersion options, then you're going to start leaning towards the wet, wet method. I mentioned wet method. Though. So this is how do you develop a method? So I, I kind of went for how do you make a method? I make a measurement, and I kind of wave my hands about dispersion and and liquids. But you ought to be a little bit deliberate about this. First, you determine a particle refractive index, choose your liquid, choose your sampler, choose your settings, what concentration ranges work, how long do you measure, do you need ultrasound? So refractive index determination, there are a few different methods. My strongest recommendation is to find it, certainly the real component, by a literature or web search, a Becky line test, uh, yeah, any way you can get that sort of data or an estimate. Then uh, there's not very good data on imaginary refractive index, index values, and in practice, those depend a bit on particle surface roughness. So we can uh, measure a sample and vary the imaginary component to see if and how the results change. And then we, we can recalculate to using different imaginary components and pick one that minimizes the uh, R parameter. I don't like doing that for the real component, although the software does automate the process uh, because we're really adding another degree of freedom to the problem. And, and I prefer not to do that, not to add more degrees of freedom. So now I have to get both size distribution and refractive index. I'd rather not have, have to get both parameters in a single measurement. Concentration, um, well, you're really kind of be working between two, uh, two limits. 
if you have too few particles, you have a very poor signal to noise ratio. You just don't have enough scattering. Uh, you also, if you have too many, you're going to start seeing multiple scattering effects and that's going to lead to distorted results. So typically values from about 80% to 95% transmittance are good. Uh, the, the LA960 is a very sensitive instrument and running at fairly high transmissions uh, works better than you would expect. But you want to plot, as you're developing a robust recipe, you want to plot uh, obtained size as a function of T percent and look at and look at how it changes and look for the flat spot. So you see here in the bottom left, my chi-square, which is a measure of goodness of fit, um, at high transmittance on the left, so the bottom, that 97, so the bottom axis is transmission, but high transmission is on the left. So that's a low particle concentration. I see a fairly high uncertainty at distorted D50 value. As I add more and more sample, my transmittance goes down, say to 93.6. So it's down by 4% or so. My D50 now is insensitive to transmittance and my noise value is pretty good. So that's where I like to operate. And particularly if you're developing method that you want to ensure is robust, you want to look for that flat spot. Okay, you might need ultrasonic dispersion or you add energy to break up the agglomerates. Also see that phrase as air pressure on a dry powder feeder. That's typically set to top. Everybody sets it up to the highest value, including me. And then looking at how much energy I add by varying the time. And I look at the tails of distribution. You know, are my large particles kind of disappearing as I remove agglomerates? Do I see new small particles appear due to breakage? So I test reproducibility and robustness as well, uh, because the, you're really, most people are really using particle size, and particle measurement to keep score for some other, for something else, whether it's dissolution, whether it's how well something's going to pack. And so getting the same number consistently for the same sample is very, very important. And in many ways, more important than getting the right number. Um, for whatever right means. Nope, don't use ultrasound on emulsions. You'll do all sorts of fun things to your second liquid phase. Uh, you can see uh, thermal mixing or thermal uh, issues with organic liquids. And if you're putting in a lot of ultrasonic energy, look at, at external probes. So in theory, if I plot energy on the bottom and particle size on the left, the particle size will drop. I'll see a nice region, region of stability, and then I'll start dropping again. But really what happens is that curve is softened out. So that's on the right, where my size just smoothly goes down with increasing energy. That's either higher air pressure or longer ultrasound duration. The problem is that you really have two things going on. You have dispersion, which is breaking up your, your loose agglomerates, and that's nice. And then you have milling, which is where you're breaking up your primary particles into small particles. So on the top, I showed theoretical. I have some loose agglomerates, proper air pressure. Okay, they separate nicely. Too much air pressure, too much ultrasound. Now I start breaking up the primary particles. What really happens is I add some air pressure, I break up my loose agglomerates, and I accidentally break a few loose particles. Air pressure goes too high, everybody's broken. So this problem varies. If you have a very uh, tough, durable material, you won't see this as much as if you have something very loose and delicate. Uh, so you start making these plots. This is uh, microcrystalline cellulose with different air pressures, um, a high pressure, a medium pressure, a low pressure. And medium and low pretty much give me the same answer. And so I'm going to pick medium or low air pressure. Uh, there is a software tool that lets you systematically test all these parameters. And one thing I get into when I talk about method development is being very systematic in your method development 
if uh, if you're going to use the method for something that's well, I'll say economically critical, you have a new material. You're kind of trying things out uh, and using that data to guide you for your next initial experiments. You can take shortcuts in your method development. If you have a manufacturing process, you're running three shifts. You need and if things go out of spec, it's a big deal. Then you need to be very, very careful and deliberate about your method uh, development so that when people have questions, you have answers. Um, by the way, this is the rep reproducibility plot from before where my D50 mean size is 8.2, the standard deviation is 0 0.02, coefficient variation is 0.3%. So that's really, really nice data with medium air pressure. Some other examples, and, and a lot of the rest of the talk is example data and what you can get under good conditions. This is cement measured dry, average size 11.15 microns. I'm sorry, a, average value of D50 of 11.15 microns. Coefficient variation is 0.24%. Uh, D10, 3.2 micron. D90, 25 micron. We can also run that same thing in isopropyl and alcohol. My D10 is now 2.06 versus 3.1, D50 11.7 versus 11.15, and 27 versus 25. So they're very, very close, even though it's two quite different measurements. And I like this measurement because it makes me feel good. We have good methods for this sample. And then you can start saying, well, most of the time my cement is dry, so why mess around with IPA? Uh, so that might drive your method development choices there. Uh, instrument instrument variations can be very tight uh, with laser diffraction, which is nice if you have the same instrument in multiple sites. I will add that when you start looking at things like instrument to instrument variation and repeatability, this is a testament not just to instrument performance, it also relies very much on your operators and on your samples and your sample prep. So for example, this is a set of 20 instruments. These are all kind of broad standards, but they've been riffled so that every bottle sample is the same. This is an industrial sample. You'll see some, let's go back a second. Coefficient of variation of one to three uh, percent. Here, I can see coefficient of variation on D50 about 0.6 percent, and this other one is 0.3 percent. Uh, so this does happen for practical systems. This is four different LA960s for two different formulations. Uh, again, a lot of attention paid to how it was do done. Uh, for this system. I think there was also thought about which surfactants to use, and we do have uh, a webinar on dispersion. Um, they may want to take a look at, particularly if you start looking at different what to add to water to make particles behave better. Well, I hope I gave you a sense of laser diffraction, and then here I'm going to talk about kind of well, what's the bad news? It, first, the data really drives you towards a volume basis result. Uh, laser diffraction is great for giving volume, and that's good because uh, that's what a lot of processes rely on. So if you're trying to do a mass balance and you have laser diffraction results, so you're looking at volume or mass of spheres in each size class, you're pretty happy. If you start looking at number balances, then you're going to start running into some, uh, some significant uncertainty. You also don't get any shape information in practice. Uh, I, by the way, you can get particle shape uh, by aligning all of your particles uh, using 2D. Well, first you make sure all your particles are the same shape, then you make sure they're all aligned, and then you can start playing detector games to get a shape information. Not really practical uh, for kind of industrial laser diffraction or particle analysis. In, in practical analysis, the particles are tumbling, and so it's going to smear out any shape information you have anyway. So laser diffraction has a lot of benefits. Very wide size range from tens of nanometers to, million, to many millimeters. Uh, very flexible for sample handling. It's fast. I have high throughput, hundreds of samples a day. 
and fairly easy to use. Uh, probably half this comp this talk is really implemented in the magic boxes, and you will kind of know what they're trying. You want to know what they're trying to do, but you don't need to be able to do it yourself. Um, if you have good design, you can get very good precision. Reduces unnecessary time spent investigating process deviations. And that's good instrument design and good method design. Um, the first principle is measurement. You don't really need to calibrate. We're counting on the angle, wavelength of light, and the angles of the detectors. Uh, and there's a huge global install base and a huge history. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're looking at a process that's been running for many years or many decades, quite often it's been tracked by laser diffraction the entire time, and your discontinuity has happened with each generation and improvement in diffraction analysis. But lots of people know what diffraction is, lots of people know how to make samples, uh, there's just a whole lot of history. You know, we have a uh, you know, just a huge amount of information here at Hariba uh, about the different kinds of samples. If you go and look at a manufacturer, they'll know their material, 47 ways to make it run properly for analysis and diffraction. Okay, so I'm going to say thank you very much and open the floor for questions. Thank you, Jeff, for the excellent talk as usual. Um, when I was sitting in to listen to your talk, I realized that this is a lot of information um, that can be further elaborated into a six-part educational webinar series that you've done. Yeah, that, that's uh, a real good point because there are a lot of things that I start here and then they're jumping off points to that longer to start discussion. Um, okay, so the question here, um, can laser diffraction be used for virus particle measurements? Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, laser diffraction can be used for size distribution of virus particles if you have enough particles and uh, if they're big enough. Uh, so if you think about somebody AAVs, at, they're probably not gonna work out too well. If you start, um, if you start looking at lengthy and larger, so the 100 nanometers and up, I've seen successful laser diffraction measurements. Uh, that's probably where you're going to need our small volume cells because having enough sample is a question. And, and it's used in practice if you're concerned about aggregation of the virus particles. Mm. Uh, yeah. Now, the downside is you can't count or correlate to infectious titer, uh, which would push me towards nanoparticle tracking. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so yes, how's that? Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's a very loaded question, I realized. Um, <laughs> another question was really, the, this person is studying the technology of size distribution and shape of micro nano bubbles. Can laser diffraction be used for that? I'm sure it can be. I'm trying to think if we've run any nano bubbles in laser diffraction. I know we've been running nanoparticle tracking analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I've seen a nano bubble. And I, I, I okay, I've d seen nano bubbles done by DLS. I've seen them done by nanoparticle tracking. I, no one's ever asked me to do nano bubbles in diffraction. Uh, the DLS pushes because they wanted them so small, mm -hmm. and then the nanoparticle tracking is they want a concentration. I'm going to say yes because they they should scatter. They do scatter very nicely. Uh, I, I haven't seen people ask a laser diffraction question with those. Right. Um, I think we recently received one in the lab, but most people want to know the concentration as well. But that's, that's exactly, good to know. Yeah, exactly what I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this person wants to know the important size estimate with Hariba instrument compares to current practice of using Hegman gauge. Aha, this person also wrote that when they registered. Now, I just yes. saying that to thank, thank, thank you very much because <laughs> I got a slide ready. Um, so Hegman gauge is, is kind of a plate with a slope to it. And you put a slurry in the, in the channel and you put a slurry in the channel and you, and you scrape a straight edge across 
And when a surface gets disturbed, well, you know you got particles at that size at, um, and larger. And so really you get information from the Heckman gauge on the largest particles only. You don't you know, kind of, okay, what's my biggest particle in my sample? That's what you get there. What you also get with the Heckman gauge is a very inexpensive and um, yeah, it, and robust device compared to a laser diffraction analyzer. As you can see, it's it, it's kind of a precision set of machine precision machine block you can hold in your hands, and you're not picking up an LA960 or LA350 with one hand anytime soon. Uh, so, uh, but, yeah. So I guess what you're going to get moving to laser diffraction is um, you're going to get a lot more detail about your samples and you might get better reproducibility because um, you're going to look more at the center of the range than just the largest particles. What you're, you're going to spend more money, um, you might, and speed-wise, we're probably gonna be a little faster with laser diffraction. So you get a lot more information about kind of your average particle size, your median size, and your fines. And those are things you just don't learn with Heckman gauges. Thank you, Jeff. If laser diffraction is first principle and requires first principle physics and requires no calibration, then why are particle standards used? Ah, because we um, just because I just because I tell you it it's going to work doesn't mean you should believe me. I guess is the <laughs> is the summary of my answer. <laughs> so I. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, someone builds a particle analyzer and puts it in a truck, and then it goes on a plane, and then it goes another truck, and it arrives to your site. Who knows what happened to it? So, problem one is you want to make sure things survived. Now, we pack it pretty well, so it survives most of the time. But so we do want to confirm the analyzer is operating properly, and that's really what you're doing with the particle size standards. And 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 if you use a narrow standard, you can confirm all your optics are still right. If you use a broad glass, broader standard, you can start looking at questions about mixing and so on. Well, thank you for your authenticity and honesty. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, what is the difference between laser diffraction and UV vis spectroscopy? Um, and I'll throw in XRD as well, since the other person mentioned about XRD. So laser diffraction, UV vis, XRD. Okay, um, let's start with X, XRD. Uh, the, um, I don't know if you remember, you probably don't remember, but uh, earlier I mentioned the parameter X, which is the particle size divided by the wavelength of light. And, and so really, X-ray diffraction is going to get you very, very short wavelengths, which lets you get to much smaller structures. And so you'll see laser diffraction used to probe uh, lattice constants in metals, for example. Uh, then you can look, now there's a second effect, which is those X-ray diffraction peaks start to broaden as your particle sizes, um, I forget which way it goes, as they go down, yeah. So that's helpful if, let's say you have a powdered metal that's all pressed together, then you use X-ray diffraction to find the particle size, even if the particles are like stuck together. Um, or look at grain sizes and the like, which you really can't do with with, DL, with laser diffraction because you have to separate the particles. Uh, so, yeah, if I think of X-ray diffraction as a particle technique, it does help you a little bit with crystalline materials that are all stuck together. You want to see the primary particles, uh, not the kind of tight agglomerates that you would see with laser diffraction. Uh, the second comment of X-ray diffraction is you're really probing uh, smaller length scales and looking at your your uh, at your crystal structure and that crystal structure of course gets uh, gets you towards what elements or what uh, what materials you you're looking at. Now let's go to UV vis. Uh, so UV vis you're not looking at scatter at light hitting a particle and then re-rating a scattering, you're looking at absorption. 
And so that absorption is going to depend on what electron transitions are allowed in the material. Uh, so if you have that absorption, you say, oh, it's absorbing at these wavelengths, that can tell you how much proteins in the sample, for example, uh, which is a completely different question from how big are the aggregates. So it answers a different kind of question. Now, it's a nice opportunity to kind of segue into another thing that happens. You have a part, you have light come in, and I like scattering, uh, and there's a little bit of scattering where the wavelength is shifted, and that's Raman scattering, and that's also going to tell you about chemical structure. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of instruments in Raman microscopes that do that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but for me, I ignore it. It's like one photon in 10,000. So uh, tell my tell my Raman buddies, I still don't care. Uh, then the other thing that will happen is light can come in, excite electron up a level, electron falls back down and re-radiates at a short wavelength, and you start seeing fluorescence type phenomena. Another probe of uh, chemistry, but not really of particle size. Of course, uh, you know you look at all these excitation emission spectra for fluorescence, and they have that uh, Rayleigh scattering band, which all the fluorescence folks ignore, and that's the only thing I look at. So there was a very long answer to a pair of compact questions. Sorry. No, that was perfect. Thank you so much for the thorough answer. Um, I want to go ahead and send our contact info in the chat box, um, and it is labinfo at hariba.com. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Yeah, um, you know, I, there's one I noticed uh, about emulsions. Uh, so I about emulsions, and I wrote that. So when I wrote, don't use, don't. Uh, test with emulsions, I really meant ultrasound in this talk. Uh, we certainly can do emulsions with laser diffraction. Whether a particle is a gas bubble or a liquid emulsion or a solid material, it's all the same to me. So sorry to interrupt, that was just, yeah. No, that was perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna give it one more minute for the uh, for questions, but if you can think of any other questions, you can also type it in an email us at labinfo at hariba.com. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, well, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's been fun. We'll, yeah. We'll get together soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, our next webinar is going to be on March 22nd, where Dr. Willie Hendrickson is going to come and talk to us about International Fine Particle Research Institute and an overview. Um, on behalf of our particle group, thank you so much for attending, and hopefully I'll see you at our next webinar. Don't miss it. Uh, Thanks, I won't. Jeff. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.